So thank you for, for the invitation. So I am Nicolas Fabre. I'm a, I'm a new postdoc at uh, Center of uh, New Technologies. And uh, I have done, I am going to present my work that I have done during my PhD thesis about uh, quantum uh, information in uh, time frequency continuous variable. So I'm going to start by a, a short introduction in quantum computing and especially how we can perform what we call universal quantum computation using either discrete or continuous variable with a photonic field, photonic quantum field. So the first way is <clears throat> um, by using discrete variable. Uh, we can encode information using such variable and uh, we are leading to describe a state, a wave function or a density matrix, which belongs to a finite dimensional Hilbert space. The first example is about to use a two dimensional Hilbert space. So you can define a qubit, which is a set of two orthogonal states. What it is important, the main property if we want for quantum computation is um, every uh, quantum speed up is actually provided by two, uh, two of its properties, uh, superposition and entanglement. Entanglement uh, only is not enough to have uh, a quantum speed up and superposition also. So a qubit is not only a set of two orthogonal states. Uh, at some point you must define uh, the noise model if it is physical or not. Uh, you must also define a fault tolerance set uh, and fault tolerance in general, it is um, when you have a, an initial encoding, uh, you, you want to know what, what is the threshold of the noise that your encoding can deal with. And then uh, you must define what it is called the universal state of gate and you must be able experimentally to implement this gate. Well, the generalization of qubit is qubit, so you, you can use a larger Hilbert space, and uh, qubit is a set of d orth orthogonal states. So the general uh, aim of uh, universal computation, classical or quantum, is you want uh, a set of gates, and uh, the product of the gate which belong to that set must uh, must allow to approximate any operation uh, with a, a given accuracy. Uh, when you use a, a two-dimensional Hilbert space, so in the qubit case, uh, for when you want, and for the case of universal quantum computation, this the set of gates can be divided into two parts: what it is called the Clifford gate and the non-Clifford gate. Uh, the Clifford gate are gates which can be efficiently simulated in polynomial time with classical resources, while non-Clifford that gate cannot. Uh, one example, because there are many of uh, universal set of gates in the qubit case, it is uh, uh, Adamar gate and Synod gate, and uh, for the non-Clifford gate, it is the pi over eight gate. Uh, so we directly see, thanks to, to this uh, terminology that the synod gate itself is not enough to provide any quantum speed up. In addition, you must add this very specific phase pattern, relative phase between the zero and the one logical gate uh, state, which is provided by the pi of the height gates. And in the QDIT, you have exactly the same uh, uh, terminology, the same uh, splitting between uh, Clifford and non-Clifford gates. So um, you can encode a discrete variable uh, by using discrete uh, variable de degree of freedom of single photons. So to define a qubit, you can use, for instance, uh, what it is called dual rail encoding. It is the presence or the absence of single photons into a spatial path. And you can also use the polarization of, uh, of single photons. For QDs, there are many examples, just the two of them. For instance, you can use the time energy beam of single photons. You can also use the orbital angular momentum of light, uh, where here on this, in this picture, you have different transversal profile of single photons, which correspond to different uh, elicities of the, of the ON. But uh, despite the fact that degree of freedom 
uh, here discrete um, is a common feature, a common cloth of both single photons and, and an intense laser field. Uh, this encoding is very different from what we can obtain with a classical field. Because at some point during a, a computation, uh, the fact that we are using a quantum carrier, such as a single photon, you are going to make use of uh, some uh, quantum correlation, such as non-locality, discord, etc. And uh, as I said, you are going to, to use the pi over eight gate, uh, which provide the quantum speed up, which is, uh, which is good for quantum, quantum computation. So you can also encode the information by using continuous variables. It can be seen as a QDIT, but you are going to perform the limit D is going to infinite, and you obtain a uh, state where Q is uh, uh, what we, I'm going to call a quantum continuous variable. And the reason of quantum is that any continuous variable is not, cannot be used for quantum computation, but at some point you must uh, have an underlying non commutative algebra of operators which apply on this state. I'm going to, to give you a more specific example of this. And well, you can define also universal quantum computation with continuous variable. And instead of having this uh, splitting between Clifford and non-Clifford gate, you have, well, the generalization of this uh, in the case of infinite dimension. And uh, the generalization of Clifford gate uh, correspond to what we uh, what it is called Gaussian gates, and Gaussian gates can be efficiently simulated in polynomial time with classical resources, and then you have non-Gaussian gate, which cannot. Uh, an important point is that certain gates uh, are easy or hard to implement experimentally. It depends only on the physical system which carry a discrete or continuous variable. It's, it is not related to the uh, mathematical property of Gaussian and non-Gaussian. So the traditional standard continuous variable in quantum computing, uh, we are uh, generally referred to what we call the quadrature position momentum variable. So uh, this uh, variable appears when we quantize the electromagnetic field in a single mode, for instance. So uh, Q and P, which are in, in, class, in classical domains, uh, scalar, uh, during the quantization, they become operators which do not commute and lead to this, as I said, the, non uh, the underlying non commutative algebra. And the eigenspectra of the Q and P operators are, uh, well, scalars, and uh, they are real continuous variables. Um, this Q and P, we can say that. Uh, that they are at some point particle sensitive variable. I mean that when you uh, perform the linear combination of the FIS operators, Q and P, you obtain creation or annihilation operators. And you can uh, define uh, the number of excitation of the electromagnetic field by using this uh, creation operators. And well, it is uh, really related to Q and P. So it is important to say that uh, this type of continuous variable, the mode is fixed, but the, the particle number distribution of the field is going to, to play a role. What it is uh, very useful in continuous variable is that uh, uh, in continuous variable, there is this very important representation, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the uh, density matrix, and it is a Wigner distribution. And it allows to have uh, a very efficient representation of continuous variable state. So in this, uh, what we call a phase plane, uh, where here you have the quadrature of the electromagnetic field, you have uh, this uh, Wigner distribution. And uh, it is important to, to, to say that this Wigner distribution, again, you are in a given mode, in a given frequency here, omega, and this distribution is uh, an image of the particle number distribution of the field. So here you have the squeeze vacuum state and here the, the uh, single photon state. So there are uh, many experimental implementation of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this type of state. You can uh, 
for instance, generate many two mode squeeze state distributed in many frequency modes, where the frequency modes correspond to what we call the quantum frequency comb. And they are a startup company which are able to do that, and also uh, many experimental group, uh, for instance, uh, this one. And I'm, uh, I'm a, I remain also that, um, as I said before, uh, the fact that some gates are easy or hard to implement does not depend on the uh, mathematical property or Gaussian non Gaussian. Uh, it just depends on the physical system which carry the variable. So here it appears in that in, in this type of physical system, this type of quantum field, the C not gate, uh, which is uh, just a bin spitter operation, is easy to implement, but the non Gaussian gate is not. Later, later on during my presentation, you will see why this uh, comment is actually uh, meaningful because I'm, I'm going to discuss about another type of continuous variable. So even if we are working with uh, such large space, um, at some, it is very important to define a qubit because uh, they are a qubit is necessary for, for quantum error correction. One way to define a qubit uh, in continuous variable, it was proposed by Kotzman, Kitev, and Preskill in 2001. And it consists to a, a sum of, uh, of squeeze state and where the zero and the one logical state are two sum of squeeze state, which are shifted from uh, an amount of square root of pi. This qubit is actually designed to be robust against quadrature shift, but it also appears that they are robust against photon losses compared to other uh, bosonic codes, which are different uh, qubits defined in continuous variable. And uh, between 2001 and the first uh, meaningful, I want to say, experimental realization of this type of state, uh, well, there is uh, approximately 20 years. And um, so there are two groups in two different platforms, superconducting platform and trampolin platform, uh, and they, they are managed to to produce uh, such a state. So just a, a small re a recap of uh, this uh, very short introduction in quantum computing is that the first way to perform universal quantum computation is by using many single photons. And you are going to use a discrete or continuous variable degree of freedom to perform a computation. Discrete, for instance, it was polarization, uh, or orbital angular momentum. Continuous variable uh, degree of freedom is not something which is very discussed in the literature right now. And this is what I'm going to explain during this talk that we can use continuous variables such as the frequency degree of freedom of single photon to perform uh, universal quantum, quantum computation. But this type of continuous variable is, well, completely different from uh, the quadrature position momentum variable. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the, but the, as uh, we are going to see that there are many, um, there, there is a, a very strong mathematical analogy between quadrature position momentum variable and frequency one. The second way to perform quantum computation, well, it is by using this um, quadrature position momentum continuous variable. And as I said, uh, in each of these uh, frequency modes, uh, which is populated by a squeeze state, uh, you can define what it is called a cluster state and you can uh, perform quantum computation. So it is one way uh, in this type of physical system to, to perform quantum computing, uh, quantum computation. So it is very important that in the two cases, which appear to be very different, uh, they share this common property that uh, they, it is each time a quantum field, single photon or squeeze state, and they are going to carry uh, uh, a, degree of, a degree of freedom, which is a frequency. There is a third way that I'm not going to discuss, but uh, which uh, will lay some, uh, some motivation is to go hybrid. What we realize is that C0 gate is actually easy to, 
CNOT gates are easy to implement in continuous variable. It is bin splitter operation. And non Clifford gates are easy to implement by using a discrete variable of single photons. So we can use, we can benefit from, from, this, uh, from this to implement uh, another way of uh, performing universal control computation. The main difficulty is actually to, uh, to, to manage to, to produce uh, entanglement between these very, type, very different type of physical system. And uh, why I don't call, uh, I'm going to propose actually another way to perform uh, control computation by saying that hybrid, uh, but this time it is by using the continuous variable of single photon and the quadrature of continuous variable state. And, uh, and this is why, and owing to this motivation, uh, I'm going to explain how we can describe a photonic field, which has both quadrature position momentum variable and spectral degree of freedom, both these continuous, if you want. And it's going to lead to describe a state with a functional approach. So my outline is this. First part, I'm going to explain how we can use continuous variable of a degree of freedom of single photons to perform quantum computation. Second part, I'm going to explain how to define a qubit which is, is actually a time frequency GKP state by using the continuous variable of single photons. Third part, I'm going to describe this uh, photonic field, which, have, which has both this continuous degree of freedom, particle number, and spectral ones. So here is my first part. Um, so I'm going to reinsist that uh, QDIT is um, uh, the continuous variable of single photons, it's like considering QDIT, but when D is going to infinite, uh, such that uh, we are going to consider a time, time and frequency variable as a continuous variable, but we can also think about transversal position momentum variable. The fact that we can uh, use this type of continuous variable to any quantum task is uh, well, I think known, but uh, to achieve uh, universal quantum computation, I think is not widespread, I think. It was first pointed out in 2011 by Stephen Walborn and, and his collaborators, uh, and they, they, they have proven that we ca they can perform quantum computation by using transversal position momentum variable. And here in the following, I'm going to discuss the time frequency variable. Again, the ability to achieve quantum computation does not depend on the dimensionality of the degree of freedom of single photons. And again, such continuous variable are very different from quadrature position momentum variable, but it share actually some mathematical analogy that I'm going to describe right uh, now. So just a, a little formalism, uh, a single photon at frequency omega is described by a creation operator uh, at at frequency omega in the mode A. And then you have this very important bosonic commutation relation, uh, which are going to what uh, I say, retain the quantum algebra. And this is owing to this uh, commutation relation, which do not, does not have any counterpart in classical, uh, in classical uh, encoding because we are the considering uh, excitation of the electromagnetic field that omega is actually a quantum continuous variable. So if you want, it is the equivalent in this encoding of Q and P, uh, which does not commute and give I. Um, a single photon wave function can uh, be uh, described by this, uh, by this integral. And the weight of the, of the integral is, uh, is called the amplitude spectrum of the source and is in general a complex quantity. So that the absolute value of this is actually the, what we can measure experimentally, the spectrum of the source. We can also define the time of arrival variable as the canonically complicated variable of the frequency just by doing a Fourier transform. Then we can define time frequency displacement operation. So a frequency displacement operation is going to shift uh, a single photon at frequency omega uh, with a a certain amount uh, delta 
and it, it can be directly written in the single photon uh, subspace uh, as here. Then we can also apply the frequency displacement operation on uh, on the single photons at time uh, with a time of arrival t, and as it is usual when we consider a canonically conjugated variable uh, instead of yeah, it is a shift in frequency while it is a, a phase in time. Anal analogously, we can define a time displacement operators and can be uh, written in the same, uh, same way. What it is very important uh, for the following is that time and frequency displacement operations do not commute. Uh, and because uh, owing to this bosonic commutation relation, and again, it does not have any classical counterparts. And this is what is called the, the Vi algebra. Uh, Nicola, can, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. So, so do you hear omega is, is limited to positive omegas or you have omegas from minus infinity to plus infinity? What's your convention? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. So generally people are, are just, it is zero from infinity, but uh, well, in, Generally, the, the amplitude spectrum of the source is a, a bounded distribution in all, all my case, which is uh, uh, far away from the bound. So that uh, the, the integration that I um, consider generally is uh, R, the full uh, real. Okay, but it's just a formal extension because it doesn't matter because you are, you yes, are in some yes. region around some your central frequency and Yes, yes. So is, is, is this something like a slowly varying amplitude approximation that, that you're making effectively? Yeah, yeah, generally I consider single photons which are centered at, uh, well, omega one's frequency and the, the reference of the frequency that I choose is uh, far, far away from the central frequency. So uh, this is why, I, yeah, I prefer to talk about R and not uh, R plus. To, for the for the integration range. Okay. So once we have defined the uh, time and frequency displacement operation uh, with the same derivation that uh, we, we we use in uh, quadrature position momentum quantum optics, uh, we can build uh, the chronocyclic Wigner distribution. Uh, but in the single photon subspace, okay. Uh, the um, mathematical properties, because you have exactly the, the same type of non-commutative algebra is the same as the quadrature position momentum Wigner distribution, but the physical interpretation is different. In particular, of course, the interpretation of the negativity, the negativity of the Wigner, distri of the Wigner distribution is generally, uh, some witness of quantumness future, but here the negativity I'm going to discuss just a little after what, what it is exactly. So universal set of gate of continuous variable single photons, because it is continuous variable, it is the same. Uh, we can uh, split into Gaussian gate and non-Gaussian gate. Uh, so Gaussian gate are, for instance, displacement, squeezing operation, and Fourier transform. And they are, well, easy or hard to implement with the actual technology. It is hard to say because they, they are huge improvements. Uh, so I'm not able to classify if it is easy or hard. Um, but what it is shows that it is hard to implement, it is a CNOT operation because single photons uh, do not want to talk with each other. And so because it requires a huge amount of nonlinearity. So C not gate is uh, very difficult to implement, but it is only reminiscent because we are using single photons and it is uh, the scalability issue of, uh, of single photons. But what it is uh, a benefit of this encoding is that non-Gaussian gate is easy to implement because it, at some point it only requires a special light modulator uh, and well, if you want, this gate is a little as the uh, infinite uh, generalization of the pi over eight gate for the qubit encoding. 
So there are important details that I want uh, to, to mention is that the proof of universality does not require a time and frequency operators. You, the operators that I presented are, are enough and, uh, exact, and if you want to, to, to show the proof, you can see the article of Stephen Walborn in 2011 that I, I gave just uh, before. A smaller detail is that if you, uh, you can uh, circumvent the, uh, the use of time and frequency operators by using a phase space approach. Um, but nevertheless, uh, to introduce a time operator is, is possible actually, but it requires to add, um, to increase the size of Hilbert space and actually to add an ancilla quantum clock. Uh, there are, well, it is a quite hard theory from uh, Wouters in the 80, uh, but uh, well, I think there are two re really recent articles from these uh, two, from these authors that explain very well how we can define uh, properly a time operator. Um, and then we can use these uh, time and frequency operators to, 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 uh, to have a, a proof of universality uh, in, uh, in this encoding. Well, another detail, but important detail is that um, we are dealing with ultra relativistic particle, which is here the photons, so that you have this uh, very difficult equation of motion x, the longitudinal position, is, act is equal to the speed of light uh, cross the time. So uh, then um, you, time and position, the longitudinal one is not independent, um, but uh, well, I'm going just to. Um, to develop this one dimensional situation and the other coordinate Y and Z, I'm not going to, to concentrate. And the last detail is about Gaussian operation. In this encoding, it is quite simple. It is about measuring the frequency and time of arable uh, distribution of single photons. So it has nothing to do with homodyne detection. Just for to, to remind what is the OM experiment, because at some point I'm going to use it, because it is very useful to this experiment to have signature of manipulation of the uh, frequent of the frequency distribution of single photons. So the OM experiment, OM stands for Angu Mandel experiment, uh, which was proposed in uh, uh, 1987. Um, you are going to start from two single photons where here you have the temporal wave packet of single photons and one of the temporal wave packet are, is going to be shifted by an amount tau. Uh, because single photons are bosonic particle, uh, you have, uh, after the bin splitter, you have uh, four events which are going to interfere. Uh, the first, the first one are bunching events where you have two single photons which are going to uh, exit the bin splitter by the, in, in the same output. And then you have coincidence uh, events uh, where, which correspond to, to, to this type of events. When there is no marker on the path here, so that when tau is equal to zero, uh, here you have a perfect destructive interference uh, phenomena, and when you, and if you measure coincidence probability, uh, it's going to to give you zero because uh, actually photons are um, bosonic particles. But as soon as you are going to mark the path, uh, then here you mark the path by uh, changing the higher vol time of one of the photons. Uh, the coincidence probability is not zero anymore and you are going to follow uh, this, uh, this trajectory. So here, this is, as I said, the coincidence probability and here on this uh, axis, it is the marker of the path, which is here tau. But there is more than this for the home experiment. You can consider what it is called the generalized home experiment. Uh, instead of having just a time shift, you can also add a frequency shift uh, here on this path. And 
we can actually extract uh, some information about uh, the wave function of uh, photon pairs. So the photon pairs is the following. It is uh, here, I'm going to call it signal and idler photons. And in general, photon pairs can be described by such wave function. Here, the joint spectral intensity, uh, joint spectral amplitude is uh, the amplitude of probability of measuring uh, the, a photon at frequency omega and, uh, and the other photons at frequency i. So instead, here, uh, to consider single photon state, here it is a two photon state. I'm going to assume that the joint spectral amplitude can be decomposed as a product of two functions, f plus and f minus, which depend on collective variable omega plus and omega minus, which is uh, omega plus is the sum of omega s, omega i, and omega minus is the subtraction of omega s, omega i. What we can show is that the coincidence probability, which is the same experiment, it is the Ohm experiment, but by adding this frequency shift, you can show that the coincidence probability is actually proportional to the chronocyclic Wigner distribution of the function f minus. So you do not have the full information of the wave function, which is uh, normal, but you can at least uh, measure, the, you can perform the full tomography of this function f minus. Uh, and f minus is actually the phase matching function of uh, some spontaneous parametric down conversion process. So, and another important point is that, uh, as I said, uh, how we can interpret the negativity of, uh, the, of uh, the chronic cyclic linear distribution. Uh, actually, you can interpret the negativity of uh, this chronic cyclic linear distribution as an entanglement witness, uh, because uh, as soon as uh, the W minus is negative, it means that the photon pairs is actually a uh, frequency entangled. Well, it's a witness. So in my second part, I'm going to explain how we can use, um, how we can encode the qubit using the time frequency continuous variable of uh, single photons. So uh, the idea is to uh, use what it is called a microcomb. So a microcomb is um, uh, a single photons which, uh, which are in uh, a, a linear coherent superposition of many frequency modes. Uh, so you define the, the two logical uh, qubit state as two microcombs, which are shifted by a, an amount uh, omega bar. Since it, since it is a, a, a microcomb in the frequency domain, it is also a comb in the temporal domain and uh, the, the corresponding states are, well, a comb, but you have a, a different phase pattern. So the state that I, that I have shown is not physical because um, it has a very large envelope and also every pix is infinitely thin. So uh, we can actually create a more physical uh, frequency time GKP state by first applying a time noise. So a time noise is you apply on this unphysical uh, GKP state, uh, a displacement, a time displacement operation multiplied by a Gaussian distribution with width delta. So it's going to give uh, an envelope of the full state, but not a width of each peak. So if you want a width for each peak, you are going to apply a frequency noise. So you have this two step time noise, which is the time noise, it is the full envelope and then frequency noise, which is the, the bandwidth of each peaks. Okay. Um, so when we see this, of course, uh, when we know about the traditional quadrature GKP state, uh, well, they are the same form, but it is of, of course, different physical system. Here, it is a microcom state, so it is a simple photon which populated many frequency modes. And here, it is a sum of many squeeze states. But it, what it is interesting to note is that uh, because uh, we have this analogy because uh, between uh, quadrature position momentum variable and continuous variable uh, degree of freedom of single photons is that we have actually a 
a mathematical analogy between the squeezing of each peaks for the traditional GKP state and the bandwidth of uh, each uh, frequency peaks. And only because we are in single photon subspace, because of course this analogy does not hold if we are considering not a microcomb, but a classical comb. So this uh, qubit is actually designed to be robust against um, errors and it, by, uh, against shift errors. And it is because you have this redundancy of information. So uh, we can define, let, let us define the two um, arrival time beams, okay? So in blue, it is the time arrival beams of the zero logical state, and in red, it is the time arrival beam of the one logical state. Then the qubit state are actually, the zero logical state are actually uh, Gaussian state, which are centers at each of its beam, okay? And owing to dispersive effect, uh, second order dispersive effect, each temporal wave packet uh, are, are going to spread um, and then after this, uh, uh, this, uh, this type of errors, what we, what we have is that you have actually small probability to measure a one logical state while uh, it is actually a, a zero logical state that you, that you want to transmit. So uh, this bit flip op uh, operation, well, it is actually a bit flip operation if it's an encoding and it is exactly what we want to correct. And this is what I'm going to discuss just after how we can uh, correct uh, this type of errors. So how we can create this type of state? We can create this state by using uh, this integrated optical photonic circuit, which is uh, elaborated by uh, my former experimental group led by Sarah Ducci, Florent Barbou, and Maria Manti. So uh, this device works at room temperature and um, well, you have a, a classical pump, which is here, this, uh, this uh, red uh, classical field, and it's going to generate by spontaneous parametric down conversion to uh, photon, the signal and the high blur. And because uh, the, the full uh, device is placed into the air, actually, uh, because the refractive, the refractive index of the semiconductor device is 3.3, you have a natural fab repair cavity effect, okay? So the photon, the signal and other photon are going to make some back and forth between actually leave the cavity. So here on the right, you have the joint spectral intensity, which is again, the probability of measuring a signal photons at frequency omega s and idler photon at frequency omega i. The full uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion process is actually delimited by energy conservation and phase uh, matching conservation. The energy conservation are going to give a width of the joint spectral intensity along the omega plus axis and the phase matching condition are going to give a frequency width al along the omega minus axis. And in addition to all this process, there are all the modes which are allowed by the cavity, and this is why we have this comb structure. So at the end of the day, what we have is uh, an entangle, uh, uh, a micro, uh, micro, two microcombs which are entangled. Uh, we have at least uh, in, in this experiment, 550 pigs, which are obtained by uh, stimulated emission tomography. So there are two alternative views. The first uh, way to describe the wave function outside the cavity, and, we, and we, which is uh, traditionally used, is to start with a pump and is going to generate uh, by, uh, by this nonlinear process the signal and the idler photons. And the nonlinearity is described by a nonlinear Hamiltonian. So, this is the first way to, to, uh, to, have, a, to have a derivation of the wave function at the output of the process. The second way is completely different, is to say that uh, you have no pump, okay, no classical pump. You are going to start from two fictitious ideal signal and high state. 
since they are ideal, they are not physical, so that you are going to feed them to make it grow well by applying displacement operation. So you are going to give a temporal noise, a temporal and a frequency noise uh, for both of them. And then you are going to describe the entanglement of, uh, of the photon pairs by applying the equivalent of uh, uh, continuous C naught gate, which is the equivalent of um, the bin splitter operation, but in the time uh, degree of freedom of single photons. And the state that you have here is exactly the same as here. And the joint spectral intensity is looking like this. So in this direction, the envelope is actually the phase meshing condition, but here in this interpretation, it is the temporal noise of the idler photons. And the energy conservation is actually the uh, inverse okay, of the temporal noise of the idler. And then the frequency, as I said, the frequency uh, width of each peak is actually the frequency noise of the signal and the idler. So this uh, writing is very reminiscent from the measurement-based quantum computation picture. So it is one way to, uh, to, to uh, formulate uh, how to perform universal quantum computation. The main idea is the following, you are going to start by generating a large uh, entangled state. Well, here is not so large because you have only two single photons, but well, it is only because uh, right now the, the technology of to, to scale the entanglement between single photons is uh, very hard to do experimentally. But okay, uh, once we have generated uh, an entangled state, the next step is well, to perform some operation in one of the spatial modes. And by performing some uh, measurement, uh, you are going to teleport uh, some operation uh, to uh, modify the state. So what we can do is actually to perform a quantum time error correction. The main idea is uh, you have a, a very noisy qubit in time and you are going to untangle a fifth qubit with uh, another qubit, which is less noisy. What I say about less or more noisy is I'm referring to, uh, you know, all this uh, arrival, uh, time arrival buildings that I defined before. What we, you can do is that by untangling, by untangle uh, a very noisy qubit with a less noisy qubit, and then by performing this Gaussian operation, which is a time uh, distribution measurement, you can actually reduce the temporal uh, bandwidth of each peaks of uh, the office microcomb. So then I'm not going to, to explain this in detail, but uh, the Angu model, you can actually uh, use, you can perform some, well, unitary operations such as time displacement operation, which is in this encoding single qubit gate. And you can, uh, thanks to the Angu-Mandel interferometer, uh, have uh, some signature of the manipulation uh, of, this, uh, of this operation. So I'm going to finish very, um, very fastly about another type of continuous variable. So it is uh, motivated by a uh, fist this new way of performing universal computation, what I said about going hybrid uh, by using continuous variable of uh, photonic field and also by using the quadrature position momentum continuous variable. So I'm going to uh, show you uh, that uh, it leads to uh, use a functional description of a photonic field. And this is what I have done with my collaborators, Philippe Stephanis Roux uh, in South Africa. This formalism is known in condensed matter theory and uh, in quantum field theory, but here I'm going to, well, to, to use it for quantum optics perspective. So the main message is this, we want to describe a photonic field which have both frequency and quadrature continuous variable. And we are going to uh, consider the amplitude spectrum function which contain both spectral and quadrature continuous variable as a continuous variable itself. So the function right now is going to be a continuous variable. 
And to illustrate uh, the, the, this uh, theory, uh, I'm going to take the example of the bosonic coherent state, which is a continuous multimode generalization of the monochromatic coherent state. So let us start with a single photon state, which is uh, this, uh, which is described by this wave function. And then we are going to take the exponential of uh, this cat. So it's not a single photon uh, anymore, but it is a, it is a state which have uh, as a mean photon number one because the spectrum is normalized. But we, we can uh, generalize a little this and saying that we can define what it is called a boson current state so that instead of having a, a normalized function here, the you are considering this variable as this function as a continuous variable and is not going to be a normalized function anymore because, uh, well, when it is not normalized, the mean photon number is different than one. And well, it means that this function contain both the spectral distribution of the quantum field, but also the photon number distribution. So it, it was actually found out uh, in this uh, quantum optics article in 2001, uh, and they used this type of state to describe uh, a laser field in, in full detail. So we can easily recover the monochromatic case, the current state that we are used to in quantum optics. Uh, to do that, we can first separate between the particle number degree of freedom and the spectral one. So here alpha is the usual alpha in quantum optics and carry the particle number uh, information and S of omega is the spectral distribution. Then we are doing the monochromatic approximation saying that, okay, we have some distribution center at omega zero and from this uh, bosonic coherent state, we can recover the coherent state in quantum optics. Just to finish, uh, well, we can, uh, once we have this type of continuous variable, we can uh, define uh, a functional Wigner distribution and which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the density matrix uh, of uh, a photonic multimode field. But here the variable in between bracket and is not a normalized function anymore. So a uh, functional, we don't have to be afraid of. Uh, it's just that as input it is uh, a function, but the output, it is a scalar, okay? So the full quantity, the full function of linear distribution is a scalar quantity. So uh, there are many examples where we can calculate anal analytically this, uh, this uh, linear distribution. Uh, so uh, for instance, we can uh, calculate uh, bosonic state, squeeze state, etc. I don't have the time to, to discuss this. And uh, this uh, formalism was, uh, uh, used uh, many times right now by my collaborators uh, to describe uh, high level entanglement between modes and uh, number and the photon numbers and to describe the full state generated by the quantum metric down conversion. And as I said, I'm going to use this formalism to, uh, to, well, to have another way to perform universal quantum computation by using continuous variable degree of freedom of a quantum field and continuous variable quadrature position momentum. So in conclusion, um, in this session, I discuss the use of continuous variable of single photon that they can be used to achieve universal quantum computation. How we can uh, encode the qubit uh, by using such large Hilbert space um, and we are leading to, the, to, to use uh, microcom. And lastly, a very, uh, not in very detail, but how we can uh, uh, describe a, a, a photonic field which have this very different continuous variable degree of freedom. I have also uh, done other works uh, which, uh, which include uh, how we can uh, engineer a useful time frequency uh, B photon state in these uh, two publications. In long term perspective, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about um, performing uh, some metrologies. Uh, quantum metrology study, and especially to, to study multi-parameter estimation uh, by using a microcom, especially because you have this, uh, this microcom structure. Well, 
I would like to thank all my uh, former theoretical team. Uh, so my supervisor, Pedro Newman and Keller, uh, two collaborators, Simone Felicetti, Tomat Kujo, the experimental le team led by Sarah Ducci, Florman Pabu, and Maria Manti. All of them are at Paris University in the Kite team. All the PhD and uh, sometimes postdoc students uh, now uh, in my group and my collaborators, Stephanie Filippi, also at uh, National Metro Institute of South Africa, and Olivia Pfister at uh, Charlottesville in, uh, at University of Virginia in the US. Thank you for, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Nicolas, for this very interesting and very broad presentation. We have time for a couple of short questions. We are running slightly behind the schedule, but I think we can squeeze in a couple of questions if anyone has any of those. I have a question, Conrad. Can I ask? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Uh, so, Nicola, thanks for a very nice talk. I just didn't get, maybe I was just too sloppy listening, but I wanted to understand what is the role of GKP codes? For me, this is an error correction code. You're encoding the qubit into this comp structure. Where do you need the error correction kind of uh, the, the concept? Or is it just that it reminds of it or? Yeah, so, so for the uh, usual GKP state, where yeah, you have a sum of squeeze state, okay? But it will work the same thing for the, what I call the time frequency GKP state. Uh, the, when you have uh, this type of, um, of uh, non-Gaussian state, which cross mm -hmm. uh, a Gaussian noise channel, what's going to happen is that uh, you are going to, uh, to lose photons, okay? So when you lose photons, the squeezing is going to, uh, to, be, to, to decrease. And at some point, well, what you have here on this slide, well, when, when the squeezing is going to decrease uh, owing to photon losses, well, what you have, the zero, the zero logical state are going to enter in the one, uh, in the one logical pins, okay? And this is exactly the type of errors that you want to correct. Uh, okay. And the, this type of qubits are, they are designed to be, to be, um, to be able to correct um, this type of errors. And one way to correct these errors is uh, the following scheme uh, is, okay, you have one qubit, which is um, quite noisy, which means that uh, the you have you have lost uh, you have lost too many photons, so that the squeezing is is quite low, mm -hmm. and you are going to use uh, a more healthy uh, GKP state to cure actually the others, and you can actually do that. You can actually increase the squeezing of each of the peaks just by well, first you have to untangle them, and then by performing a homodan detection. Okay, but the C not gate is not a problem because before you said it's hard. I don't, well, the C not gate, uh, when we are dealing with uh, quadrature okay. GKP state is easy to do because it's just a bin splitter operation. Okay. But for time frequency operation, when uh, homodan detection is not homodan detection, but uh, just uh, the measurement of the high level time, yes, the bin splitter is hard to do. And this is, but what it is interesting is that directly as the input of the uh, spontaneous parametric down co uh, conversion, you have directly all of this. So you don't need uh, to untangle two different qubits. And this is what it is interesting. Uh, you can just, just after the sp spontaneous parametric down conversion, perform a, a temporal measurement to correct the temporal noise of the others. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One uh, more question. Can I, can I have? Can I have a question? Uh, yeah, please do. So, so the mm, the beam splitter that you mentioned, are there any any kind of experimentally realistic uh, ideas on on how to make the the beam splitter necessary for using the the time frequency GKP states for um, quantum computation? So, 
Uh, well, as I said, uh, in, in this uh, picture, you have naturally one, okay? But it is not, uh, well, of course, what we want is uh, to start from two independent single photons and then uh, performing this uh, uh, continuous, uh, this bin spitter operation in uh, this uh, type of continuous variable. But uh, right now, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't see any experimental, uh, well, nonlinear pro process which can do this type of operation. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it is time to finish. So let us all thank Nicolas for, for the seminar. I don't know how to do it online. We have to do clapping online.